I'm Zibby Owens, and you're listening to the Webby-nominated podcast, Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. This episode has been sponsored by Lauren Gabrielson, which is a women's wear brand that creates elevated essentials for the modern women's wardrobe. The collection is entirely designed and produced in Brooklyn, New York. The Lauren Gabrielson woman values quality, versatile pieces that she can wear every day that are customized to her body, her time, and her style. And by the way, I have two Lauren Gabrielson headbands, which I wear all the time, and you can see in my photos on my events page because I wear them everywhere, and they're amazing, and actually my six-year-old daughter steals mine all the time. So anyway, laurengabrielson.com. I'm so excited to be here today with Eve Rodsky, who's the author of Fair Play, a game-changing solution for when you have too much to do and more life to live. Eve received her BA in economics and anthropology from the University of Michigan and her JD from Harvard Law School. A former J.P. Morgan philanthropy expert, she went on to found the Philanthropy Advisory Group, which advises high net worth families and foundations on best practices and more. Eve was raised by a single mom in New York City and now lives in Los Angeles with her husband and three children. Also, in her work with hundreds of families over a decade, she realized that her expertise in family mediation, strategy, and organizational management could be applied to a problem closer to home, a system for couples seeking balance, efficiency, and peace in their home. And this book has already completely changed my life. So welcome, Eve. Thank you for coming. Oh, so great to be here with you. I said that before. I'm getting emotional. Eve and I were (laughs) were just chatting before I turned this on and already crying. So, you know. (laughs) It's a good place to start. It's a good good place place to to start. start. Authentic feeling. I was telling Eve that I've read a lot of books. There's been a lot of press and books and literature and everything on this whole very of-the-moment concept of invisible labor and mental load and all these things that women basically shoulder. And Eve's book, for me, just woke me up in a whole different way. And I don't know if it was the combination of your academic-type research, your interviews with hundreds and hundreds of people, your personal stories. Thank you. And then your solution at the end of it, not just, like, venting about it. Mm -hmm. So this book, I mean— I don't know. Like, I have not stopped thinking about it, honestly. (laughs) So let's talk about it. Fair fair play. Tell everybody what it's about and what inspired you to write this book. Yeah, so thank you for having me. I like to say that this is a book my whole life in the making. I grew up in a single mom household where I think I got the first row seat of what it looked like for one person to have to do it all. And that helped. That meant I helped my mom manage utility bills, eviction notices, And from that first eviction notice when I was eight years old, I remember thinking, this is not going to be me. I'm going to have a true partner in life. And I vowed to do that. And I did. I married that true partner. We were killing it in business and in life. He helped me secure my dream job in philanthropy. I helped him mark up his operating agreements as he grew a new business. We took turns doing the laundry, making each other dinner. It felt fair. Well... Cut to two kids later, and I find myself sobbing on the side of the road over a text my husband sent me. And that text said, I'm surprised you didn't get blueberries. And as I received that text, I pulled over to the side of the road, and I was thinking. What I was really thinking was, if my marriage is going to end, it should be over something way more dramatic, (laughs) right? Like my affair with an NFL player. (laughs) But then I thought... I used to be able to manage employee teams, and I can't even manage a grocery list because I'm so overwhelmed. And on top of it, when did I become the default for literally every single household and childcare task for my family, including apparently being the fulfiller of my husband's smoothie needs? And that's when I knew that this was not how I envisioned my life and something had to change. So I embarked on a quest. And when I talk about quest, I mean a quest like you said before— through 508 interviews with men and women, through 10 disciplines of experts, a quest to find a solution for domestic rebalance that I knew so many of us needed. And I'll just tell you one finding on my quest because we'll talk more about it. But the most interesting thing I found was that the biggest problems in marriage and in partnerships were the smallest details. So I had a COO of a publicly traded company, a woman, telling me that her greatest challenge was getting her husband to take out the kitty litter, not, you know, running her publicly traded company. I had a man in upstate New York telling me that he was locked out from his house driving around aimlessly because he forgot to bring home a glue stick for his child's art project. I'm sobbing over off-season blueberries. Well, you enter Fair Play. Fair Play is a life management system 
where at its core, at its crux, is a card game you play with your spouse that's easier to play than Monopoly, where you divide up domestic tasks based on things that you value, having conversations that actually matter to you. Ultimately, the goal is for fairness, but also for women to be able to get some time back to pursue like what makes them uniquely them. Wow. Yeah. Amazing. <laughs> By the way, I think, you know how they have those signs, like rest stops on the sides yes, of the highway? Yes. Like, this spot is sponsored by, like, yes, Saren yes. Fabrics or something. Yes. I feel like they should have, like, mom crying stops. Right, yeah, mom crying The amount of times I have had to pull over. Yeah. yeah. Right? Everybody, for one reason or another, side streets and well, whatever. Yeah. I'm like, what is wrong with me? Like, or no, driving through, like, through and barely tears. seeing. Yes. Right, <laughs> ugly crying through tears. Uh, ugly crying through tears. I think that... It happens to a lot of women because we have our, you know, realizations at certain moments of the day when it just feels like too much to bear, yeah. you know. And sometimes driving is like the only time you're alone, alone. for That's a minute, right. right? You just drop somebody off and like suddenly you're like. That's right. There's quiet. There's you're quiet. like You're left with yourself. You're left with you're yourself. Like, ah! <laughs> when you stop running, you try to start thinking like, is this, you know, this is, what, is this how I envision my life? And it was. The beauty of the book is I'm authentic. The stories are all authentic. Every story in the book is true. It's some of them had you know are concealed for privacy reasons. But the most important thing for me was to honor the stories. And you started with this whole shit I do list. Yes, yes. So sorry for cursing. Yes. My daughter's probably listening. Sorry, Phoebe. But no, you started this whole list, which actually I started a spreadsheet similar to yours. Like yes. When I, my kids were like two. Because I was like, how am I supposed mm. to manage it? Look at all the stuff I do. That's right. How did this add up like this? That's like, right. You know, because everyone's always, oh, well, find some. Maybe somebody can help you do this or that. No. No. I do this. No, like you, you do have it. to do everything. Like, you have to do everything. Like other, or, and what you said in the book too, like outsourcing a task can be more more work than doing the task that's, itself. That's correct. Like, oh, you need more help at home. Find another baby. No, it is so hard to do anything. It is hard to, like, all of it. It's that, just not to complain. Like, it's a privilege to have kids and all of it, right? It's no, joy. 100%. But there's so much that comes with it. That's correct. So tell me about how you started And this. I always say, women say to me, it's a privilege to raise my kids. And I say, well, great, because that's why I'm inviting men to share that privilege yeah, with exactly. you. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. But, uh, you, but yes, you, like, I start, so, yeah, so what happened was... Because I'm a lawyer and an organizational management specialist and a product of an academic, my mother's a professor of social work and community organizing, I wanted to make sure I knew my subject really well before I dove in. So I read every single book and article that's ever been written on the subject of invisible work, emotional labor, second shift. And that started with 1880s, Virginia Woolf, A Room of One's Own, all the way up to the more recent books that say, make a list. So I thought, let me do this. Let me try to make a list. So I started a spreadsheet called The Shit I Do. Now, the beauty of the spreadsheet was that it went viral amongst groups of women across the country. And I had people helping me fill out every single tab. And if I forgot something, someone would call me out and say, well, I don't see suns applying sunscreen on here. I'd say, no, you just didn't look under medical and healthy living. <laughs> it's under the medical and healthy living tab. Or someone would say, well, you forgot allowance. I said, no, no, allowance is in there. It's under family values and traditions. Because otherwise, why are you giving allowance if it's not to set some sort of you know, system for your children about their values? And around money. So every, you know, it was that granular. It got sourced by, I'd say, you know, dozens and dozens of women across the country. And I was so proud of it. So proud of the Should I Do spreadsheet because it ended up with 198 tabs and about 15 sub tabs. So over a thousand items of invisible oh work gosh. were on this beautiful spreadsheet. Not so invisible anymore. Not so invisible. And I kept saying, if you value, if you make the invisible visible, that has to be the first step. And it was the first step to me and my friends. And it was beautiful because it was all there. And the way that I looked at it and the question I asked was, give me every single thing that takes quantifiable time. So obviously you can't put love on the spreadsheet. I love my children. But you can put that you went to purchase flowers for their recital because that took time. So that became a tab called gestures of love because anything that took time got on the spreadsheet. So this is what happens though. I'm so proud of it. All these women in my life have helped me source it. It was this wonderful exercise. I send it off to Seth one day that says, can't wait to discuss. Seth's your husband. Seth is my husband. And still my husband, an amazing, amazing <laughs> man now. Post, Thanks, Seth. <laughs> Thanks, Seth. Post fair play, we're at a great place. Uh, I send it off to him saying, can't wait to discuss. And I didn't even get the courtesy of a three 
monkey trio. I literally just got one monkey, that one monkey that has the eyes covered. The monkey emoji. The monkey emoji with the eyes covered. That is what he sent back to me. And really, I think what I realized is he didn't want to see here or you know, speak of these issues because, you know, they it felt too overwhelming. Mm-hmm. So I think in that moment, I realized lists alone don't work, but systems do. And I do know that because I've been working for over a decade to create systems for family harmony for my clients around their family foundations and family businesses. So from there, I took that beautiful should I do spreadsheet and I started to turn it into a system. And that's how you ended up with Fair And that's Play. how I ended up with Fair Play, which is a very easy, like I said, the it's an, it's the core and the crux is a card game based on 100 task cards that were derived from the should I do spreadsheet. But the beauty of that is that it comes with a set of rules now, not just a list. And those rules are really important because they've been beta tested with over a hundred different couples at this point, and I know what works and what doesn't work. So, and it's so great in the book because you're like, don't show your husband yeah. this part now. Stop <laughs> right, here. Right, right, right. Like, don't like. You're like now. Wait a week and yeah. then come back. Do not try to push this through. That's correct. There's, it, there's a lot of do no harms in the book because again, after such a huge data set of interviews and this beautiful subset of couples who are willing to play with me to actually. So I got really good sociological data from them. I was able to troubleshoot. And so that's why my favorite chapter of the book is actually called, it's the last chat, one of the last chapters called the top 13 mistakes couples make and the fair play fix. Because I got to work with each of these couples to help them course correct. That was super helpful, by the way. Mm -hmm. Um, You had things like, okay, so let's go back for a second. So you you have all these cards, which are really tasks, which are all the things that have to get done. That's correct. You have people decide collectively which are the ones important to your family to keep. That's correct. And then you divide them up. That's correct. Between men and women. And it doesn't have to be 50-50. Nope. You said the magic number is 21 or something. Yes. Well, the beauty of this, the game is that you are imagining a life together about what you value. And so I think, you know, some women will say to me, what if my spouse doesn't want to play? Right, I was going right, to ask yes. yeah. And I think I've never seen someone want to play if it's communicated in the correct way. So everything to me, and this is what I've learned in my family foundation practice for, again, working with over hundreds of families at this point in my career, that everything comes down to communication. And a lot of women will say to me that they're afraid to have these types of conversations. And yes. Well, there's like this whole, well, women do all this better, Mm -hmm. right? This is just like Mm -hmm. women are, this is what they're supposed to do. That's correct. And we must be better. And in your book, you're like, no, 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 nobody's good at multitasking. No, no. And that, okay. So let's go down to the core crux root of the most important finding of the entire book. The most important finding of the entire book was that men, women, and society view men's time as finite and women's as infinite. And what I mean by that is men's time is guarded as a finite resource, like a diamond, and Mm -hmm. our time is looked at as sand, infinite. And without an understanding, a cultural recognition that all time is created equal, nothing is going to change. I'll say that again. (laughs) If all time is not created equal, nothing will change. And here's what I mean. This is my faith. My favorite interviews were men and women with the same job, where two pediatricians would be talking to me. And of course, because most women and all the data shows that women shoulder two thirds or more of what it takes to run a home and family, regardless of whether they work outside the home, as you'd expect in these interviews, most of the time, the women, the woman pediatrician would tell me that as she looked at my cards that she was holding two-thirds or more of the household task cards, and her husband wasn't. So when I would ask her spouse why he wasn't holding as many task cards as his wife, the number one answer from men was, because I don't have time. But why this doesn't work is because his wife is in the exact same job. So how does she have any more time than he does? That's (laughs) That's why those are my favorite interviews. You you know, because it shows, it proves that it has nothing to do with actual time. All the women 
in my interview set like that told me that they found time. And what I like to say, unless you're Albert Einstein and you can figure out the, the relativity of time, like I tried to do with my son last year when he was Einstein for his biography, time doesn't expand and contract. We all have 24 hours in a day. And when you start looking at time like that and not as time is money or I'm, it's on me to do all these tasks, then you, the culture starts to shift. Individuals start to shift. Relationships start to shift. Because men ultimately don't want unfairness. And when you start saying to them, your wife is using her time in service of the household while you get to use your time napping. for leisure, <laughs> for napping, which is, again, the all the science shows, including one of my favorite consultants, Professor Darby Saxby, she shows that men take leisure time in much more abundance than women do. Again, because my thesis that men view their time as finite and women's as infinite. So again, when all time is created equal and we realize that it's not on us, that we're not better multitaskers. There is no science to support that. I will say that a hundred times. There is no science supporting that women are better multitaskers. And I went to the top neuroscientists in the world to ask those questions. It is culturally what is expected of us. But once we can push back and say, my time is as valuable as your time, regardless of whether you make more money than me or all these other messages, then things start to change. You know, it's so funny because like this whole podcast, moms don't have time to read books. Yes. I've spent so much time thinking about yes, time, time and how to manage my own time and how to help people who don't have time. And until I finished your book, I was just sort of like, I'm going to help people with limited time. Mm-hmm. But what if they could have more time? Yeah. Like what if there's a way yes. and what if your system works? I mean, not to say No, what if. yeah, but I mean, it, and like, that's the thing, it does. What, like if it works, yes. if it scales, if everyone starts to do yes. this, if things get rebalanced in the whole country, mm-hmm. like think of the yes. contributions. Because I've seen like, I mean, anybody who takes on something massive, like managing their entire family, you, you're going to have less time for, you know, your unicorn space or your work or whatever, because, the, you know, time is finite for That's everybody. That's correct. So if you rebalance a little, like think of the contributions people can add to society. A- absolutely. That is why I do this. I wake up every day thinking about what would happen if there is societal change. I see it happening for my beta testers where women do have time and they're starting to talk about what they want to do with their time. And it's really beautiful because there are severe costs for women doing it all. There are severe costs for women holding all the invisible work at home. And those costs, I talk about them in my book. They break down into costs on your identity. Mm -hmm. Who are you? And do you see who you were before children in your life right now? There's costs on your career because the motherhood penalty is the largest penalty and the biggest discrimination on record in terms of wage discrimination between mothers and non-mothers. Mothers are discriminated against more than any other population. So your identity, your career, your marriage, and what it does to your communication and your resentment, and also, as you said, society as a whole. And finally, wellness, because the women who try to do it all are coming back. And the sad thing is almost everyone who was in a full-time job, almost every woman in my data set who was in a full-time job and was holding over 60 cards of the 100 in the Fair Play deck were reporting two things. Either that they were ready to opt out of the workforce, you know, they were teetering on the brink, or two, they had some sort of ailment. Number one being insomnia. Number two being an autoimmune disease, which was really horrible to hear. But those were the things that kept coming up over and over in my data set. So that's the sad part, that there are costs to doing it all, to holding, shouldering the burden at home. And the beauty, though, as you were saying, Zibi, is when we can gain time back and when we can do things differently, not only does it make things more efficient, which is gets time back for men and women to pursue their, what I call, unicorn space, the time to be who you want to be, the time to be uniquely you, to pursue your passions and your purpose. But you can't do that. And why I've always hated passion and purpose books is that nobody has time, no woman has time for passion and purpose without a rebalance. It only works, unicorn space only works when you have a context of being able to have someone else take some of the mental relief off you. 
I feel like I couldn't even do what I'm doing had I not gotten divorced. Yes. There's yes. no way. I couldn't even like work out. Like, <laughs> do you know, what I mean? like, you know, people say, like, oh, you have four kids to do this. Well, I have this major like cheat cheat. Yes. And that I yes. have every other weekend to myself, not only the time to get things done, but the recharging. I don't know how you get that. If you don't actually have that time, which if you're not divorced, not that I'm telling everybody to go no, get divorced. No, but, but that is right. It's that like, is no, I'm but a that, different person. that is right. That is right. This is a pro marriage book. What I'm trying to get people to is a system that looks like divorce. And what I mean by that is that one word, one word that divorce women tell me that has changed their life, and that word is ownership. And this is what I mean ownership changes the game. When you're still married, and if you want to, if this is a pro, fair play is a pro marriage book, and you want to get to where you got with it more time in a marriage, you have to move to an ownership system. Mm-hmm. And what I mean by that is before fair play, my husband would say things to me like, I got extracurricular sports. That's my, that's my thing. And I'm like, great. So what that meant for him was showing up on the field on Sunday mornings for Little League showing up with my two sons for their games. Whereas I'm still behind the scenes, like a crazy person, figuring out who they're going to play with, finding out what leagues they should be part of, registering them for the leagues, getting the schedule, putting the practice schedule on my calendar, arranging carpool for practices, purchasing their equipment, finding their birth certificate, returning stuff on Amazon when the equipment is wrong and I got a left-hand glove for a right-hand kid or whatever it was. Hours and hours and hours of my time behind the scenes just to allow my husband to claim that he was doing extracurricular sports. The game is like the easy part. Well, that's the thing, right? Showing up is just being That that is correct. The game is the fun part. The execution is the fun part. So what happens after fair play is that when you are playing, when you are holding a card, like the extracurricular Mm -hmm. sports card, you're not only responsible for the game, the fun part of showing up to watch your kid play. You're responsible for the conception, understanding what you want your children to play, to the planning, every single thing I just listed, the behind behind the scenes tasks to the execution. I call that CPE. I loved that. That was like a life-changing concept. And it is a life-changing concept. And the cool thing about it is that we know it works because it works in business. And it's been working in my practice for a decade. It's been working for over 50 years for businesses. Every single company is moving towards a directly responsible individual model. It's called DRI model. You don't walk into your boss's office and sit down and say, hey, what should I be doing today? I'll just wait here and have you tell me what to do. If you did that, you'd be fired on the spot. So we should fire people in our home who do that too. When you can move to ownership. So now, post fair play, my husband has given me eight hours a week of my time back just from that one card. I literally wow. don't think about extracurricular sports. I show up sometimes if I want to. That's a different card. That's called the showing up and participating card, which is a really fun one because it doesn't come with a mental load of all the conception and planning. So sometimes I show up if I'm happy, you know, feel like it. Other times I just use that time for myself and know that there's other times for me to see my kids in wonderful, you know, different types of activities. So that alone, one card transformed my relationship. But because my husband loved it so much and he felt good at it, he started to understand the conception, planning, and execution model. And then he understood it for more and more cards and more and more cards and more and more cards. So today we're in a system that very, feels very fair. And I have gained so much of my time back. And I'm no longer that woman who's sitting on the side of the road sobbing over blueberries. So no rest stops after all. No rest stops. <laughs> no re- I've traded rest stops for what I call check-ins, which means that we prioritize our check-in like an episode of The Bachelor. It's our weekly staff meeting, but they're really fun and they're short and they allow us to communicate in a non-emotional way and it helps us redeal cards for the week. And that's how my beta testers do things. My most successful beta testers prioritize their check-in like an episode of The Bachelor. They never miss it. So will you sell an actual game to accompany the book? Or are you going to pull the cards out of the book? Yes, it was a good question. I wanted to make sure this was accessible to as many people as possible. So I didn't want it to be a price point above a normal book. So we are offering the cards as a free download just on 
my website, evrodsky.com, and also fairplaylife.com to accompany the book. And there is a big, as you said, disclaimer, a big do no harm on the cards, just like any card game. If you just bought a card game home, but you didn't have the rules to your card game, you didn't know if you're playing war or poker or rummy, you don't want to play without really understanding the rules of the game. It'll backfire. The only thing I worry about with this is that is my own ability to let go of some of the cards or to even, especially the C and the P. <laughs> yes, yes. Okay, that's that a really- I'm so used to doing. That's correct. And there's a whole chapter in the book about that because I think the biggest hesitation women have is my husband is not going to remember. My husband is going to do it wrong. My husband has never been able to do anything right. So how is he going to do this right? I promise you- When you move to a CPE model, that all changes. And the reason why is because of context, not control. Mm -hmm. Again, this is a business concept. When you give someone context to do their job, they are very, very competent in it. If you control them, they're terrible at it. That is what the organizational management research shows. So again, a CPE model, when you're holding ownership of the conception and planning to the execution, you care. The opposite, I'll explain, is what I call the rat fuck. (laughs) So the rat fuck is what's happening in people's houses all over America. It's the number one thing I saw. And by rat fuck, I mean the random assignment of a task. So the way men are involved in daily life right now, they are responsible for pieces of execution. So back to the man with the glue stick. What was happening in his household? What was happening in his household, I found out, was that his wife had been working on some major project, a secret buddy project for her child for weeks, cutting out pictures. It required popsicle sticks, all these very intricate things to help her child do this one project. The night before it was due, they realized they had to glue the pictures onto the poster board. She did not have a glue stick that wasn't dried out. So she texts her husband on the way home from work or in the middle of his day, just please bring home a glue stick. He walks into the door. She says, I need the glue stick. He says, I don't have it. She says, get the hell out of my house. I'm done with you. Why that's happening for her, I get, right? She did everything. She held the conception. She knew about the homework assignment. She planned the entire assignment. But what she did was she gave him a rat, a random assignment of a task. She asked him for a glue stick. He reports to me he has no idea why he's bringing this glue stick home. He doesn't know about this project. And so he forgets. So in her mind, it looks like he's terrible. He can't even remember a glue stick. How am I going to put him in charge of our living will? But what I will tell you is that rats and a rat infestation of your home, they ruin a marriage. And they don't work for women. They don't work for men. And they also make you think that your spouse is terrible at anything in the home. When you move to a CPE model, an ownership model, where your spouse is responsible, your partner is responsible for the conception, planning, and execution of the entire task, then all of a sudden, standards change. It really makes me see all the things I've been doing wrong. Yeah. (laughs) Seriously, like, I've been, even in the way I ask for help, I'm not even doing it in a good way. And so, and I think people get upset about the glue stick type situations because you're already doing so much. It's just this one last little tiny thing. And, it, and then when you can't just do that one thing, like, it's over. It's over. Because you, it, you have so much you're, like, bottling up and mm-hmm, taking on. Mm-hmm. And then it's just, like, that's the final straw. And they it's don't even the know straw. they're at the final straw because they're just, like, whatever. Anyway. I, no, that's exactly, that's, we actually, we're doing a fun little video skit called The Final Straw. Oh, well, there you go. Yes, because we, re- I believe that. I think that the final straw is happening to women all over. And it's really interesting to see how the little things are what the final straw is, but it means so much more behind, it means so much more. The resentment that builds up over time that ends up being about glue sticks or blueberries is these patterns of inefficiency and lack of communication and not being aligned on expectations that don't work for any organization. Right. They don't work for any organization. So why would they work in the home? They just don't. It's time to reimagine how we do things in the home the same way that 
organizations do it all over the world. And it, I, like I keep saying, it works. I see it. I see it in my data. I see it in my beta testers. They should do like it works when they're teaching organizational behavior yes. and those like organizational like home management. That is, I want. I want to teach it at yeah, Harvard, at exactly, Yale, at yeah. community colleges. I, and not home ec the way it used to be where you're just learning how to, you know, make bread. No, not home ec. But yeah, that's what I said. Management. But real home management because it changes everything and it sets women up to succeed. My most successful beta and, testers. And men. And I mean, men. men no, don't like, men. Men don't like feeling like failures either. I mean, they, they don't like getting yelled no, at. They don't, you know. No. So I feel like this and benefits men. everybody. And men. And can, I will say, uh, thank you for saying men because I don't ever want to exclude them. And I will say the most important thing in this entire entire project was a post-it that I kept on my computer. I have a lot of post-its on my computer, but one of them said, bring men to the table, invite men to the table. It was so important to me to change the narrative about how we're speaking to men and about men. So again, what's been happening, I think, in this new cultural conversation is we're starting to see interesting articles, but a recent article, for example, said it was a long form piece of about 1200 words. And at the end, the solution was walk out of your home and strike. So straight to conflict, right? Without trying collaboration. Another article, a legit article in the New York Times that always makes me laugh was an article about a woman who suggests that you move to a foreign country where your husband learns, knows the language and you don't (laughs) so that he can fill out school forms. You won't have to. Now, I wish that I could be like living on the, you know, beaches of Ibiza because that's the Spanish speaker, but that's not very practical. Ibiza, pra- <laughs> yeah. <laughs> not practical for most families, I would say. So isn't it time that we have a solution that works for everybody? And by everybody, I mean that I mirror the U.S. Census in my interviews and my beta testers. So I know that this works for working class families, middle income families, all the way up to some of my former clients who classify themselves as billionaires. Amazing. Quickly, what is, so Hello Sunshine has picked this as a, like, what, what is this relationship about? Well, what Hello Sunshine has done for me is I sort of call myself like the Rachel Ray or, you know, like where I, I'm an unknown personality, but I do have a lot of science and expertise behind my name. And I think that's what Hello Sunshine looks for. They look for new ways to tell age-old problems for women, new ways to tell stories for women. So what happened was Reese is an old friend of mine. Reese Witherspoon's an old friend of mine. And she was actually one of the should I do sorcerers. Mm. I think she was uh, my son's one of the, she actually, I think she must, she may have been the one who reminded me that sunscreen wasn't there or that it was under the medical and healthy living tab. But she early on was really supportive of the journey of what I was trying to do in terms of making the invisible visible for women. And so from there, I got to meet her CEO, Sarah Hardin, and we really fell in love with each other. She is the living embodiment of this with three children, including a special needs child. She was one of my first and early beta testers with her husband, Dave. And from there, she really wanted to champion this as a company effort. So they're helping me amplify these messages, which is really exciting. That's fantastic. Do you have any parting advice for aspiring authors? We didn't really have time to talk that much about your writing process and everything, which I wanted to hear quickly. Like, how long did it take for you to write the book? Do you have advice? Seven years. Seven Seven years. years. Okay. Seven years. It was a lot. Well, because I decided that I wanted to make sure this wasn't just a me problem or a me and friends problem. So back to what it takes to mirror the U.S. Census in terms of ethnicity and class, it takes time to find interviews, to talk to people. So that took a long time, but it was worth it for me because I'm so confident in the system and the data. But what I'd say to aspiring authors is I'm 42. This is my first book. So it's never too late. It is never too late to take an idea that you have that came out of your life that you want to share with the world. And that's the ultimate goal of Fair Play, is for all of you women out there, and men too, to have the time to remember who you are outside of being a worker and a parent and a partner. You are somebody, and you have important things to share with the world. And that's what I think I was emotional about before, Zibby, about watching you live your unicorn space 
and how by having you out there championing so many authors, you're helping so many ideas get out into the world. So I thank you for that. Oh, thank you. And I bet you there's some people crying now oh. after our conversation because yes, I yes, feel like I'm yes, about to cry yes. again. Anyway, thank you. Thank, thank you. you for all your work for so many families and relationships and people and the country. And honestly, I am so energized by what you're doing and so grateful. Well, thank you. So. It was great being here. Thank you. Thanks again to my sponsor, Lauren Gabrielson, the women's wear brand that creates elevated essentials for the modern women's wardrobe. Lauren Gabriel Thanks for listening to Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. You can follow me on Instagram at Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. Thanks so much to Steve and Ryan at Texture Sound for the sound editing. And thank you to Morning Moon Productions for providing this fantastic intro and outro music. Thanks for listening. You could always email me at zibby at zibbyowens.com. 